Hello there. It's Thursday at noon. I know it is. Do you remember our arrangement? Thursdays at noon on CFUV. Are you ready to get started? What do you have in mind? What I want to do now is called first person plural. You make it sound excessively attractive. That's what I have in mind. Arthur Miller's play The Crucible forever set the metaphor for the McCarthy era as the Salem witch hunts. Like the 17th century oppression of women accused of devil worship and witchcraft, proved by accusation and association, the abandonment of the assumption of innocence and demand for special exemption from judicial procedure characterized the Red Scare of the mid-20th century United States. With the formulation of the House on American Activities Committee in the 1940s and the passing in 1950 of the McCarran Act, communists living in the United States became the target of a witch hunt. A sizable number of people had been and were continuing to be members of the Communist Party in the United States as a result of the Great Depression of the 1930s. These working class families and left-wing intellectuals saw the darker side of capitalism and the collapse of prosperity throughout the Western world. The religious right often co-ops the idea of family and children in popular press, so what often got lost in this witch hunt is the fact that thousands of children were living under the threat of their parents being arrested, jailed, and executed. Nothing drove this home more for the communist community than the 1953 execution of the Rosenbergs, a husband and wife who were convicted of treason and put to death, leaving behind a family and a community. Nancy Hood was one of these red diaper babies. Growing up in Massachusetts, her father, Otis Hood, was an active leader in the American Communist Party. The decision by her parents not to go underground made her life difficult throughout the 1950s and 60s, long after many people thought the Red Scare had passed. It was actually 1975 before the House Un-American Activities Committee was finally dissolved. Though by that time it was called the Internal Security Committee and it was illegal to be a member of the Communist Party until the mid-1960s. Several movies and books have been made telling the stories of red diaper babies. Nancy Hood's presentation, I've Got a Song, connects her personal story to the music of that time, music that was sung by American communists and leftist activists. As a performer whose love for music was grounded in the use of music during her trying childhood, Hood has created what she calls a living history of the McCarthy era. Music and storytelling are powerful ways not only to record history, but also to connect people and move them to social action. On today's show, we're going to talk about the role of music and story in creating social change. We will also share a sample of Nancy Hood's story and talk with her about why she has decided to tell her story at this time and in this way. there'd be 14 women arrested? No, sir, there'd be 39 now. She's sleeping. What is the child? Scooty Osborne will hang. Hang. Hang, you say? Hang. The deputy governor will permit it. He can, sir. He must. But not Sarah could, for Sarah could confess, you see. Confess to what? That she sometimes made a compact with Lucifer. 
and wrote her name in his black book with her blood and bound herself to torment Christians till God's thrown down and we must all worship hell forevermore? But surely you know what a jabber is. He is. Did you tell them that? Mr. Proctor, in open court, she near choked us all to death. I'll choke you. She sent her spirit out. Oh, Mary, Mary. She, she tried to kill me many times, Goody Proctor. Oh, I never heard you mention that before. Well, I never knew it before. I, I, I never knew anything before. When she comes into the court, I say to myself, I must not accuse this woman. Or she sleeps in ditches and so very old and poor, but then she sits there denying and denying. And I feel a misty coldness climbing up my back, and the skin of my skull begin to creep, and I feel a clamp around my neck, and I cannot breathe air. And then I hear a voice, a screaming voice, and it were my voice. And all at once I remembered everything she's done to me. Why? What has she done to you? Oh, so many times, Mr. Foster. She she come to this very door begging bread and a cup of cider and marks this. Whenever I turn her away empty, she mumbles. Mumble? She may mumble and she's hungry. Uh, what does she mumble? You must remember Goody Proctor last month, a uh, Monday, I think. She walked away and I thought my guts would burst for two days after. Do you remember it? Why, I do. I do. I, well, so I told that to Judge Hathorne and he asked her so. Sarah Good says he, what curse do you mumble that this girl must fall sick after turning you away? And then she replies, Why, Your Excellence, no curse at all. I only say my commandments. I hope I may say my commandments. Says and me. that's an upright answer. Ah, but then Judge Hathorne said, Recite for us your commandments. And of all of the ten, she could not say a single one. She never knew no commandments, and they had her in a flat lot. And so, condemned her. And not when she condemned herself. But the proof, the proof. I told you the proof. It's hard proof. It's hard as a rock. The judges said. You will not go to the court again, Mary. I must tell you, sir, I will be gone every day now. I'm amazed you do not see what weighty work we do. What work you do? Strange work for a Christian girl to hang old women. Mr. Crockley they will not hang if they confess their good will only sit in jail a while. From the time the American Communist Party emerged in 1919 until it began to fall apart in the late 1940s, an estimated one million Americans, immigrant workers and university intellectuals alike, were communists. And although the causes they stood for, fought for, and in many cases went to jail for, would hardly raise an eyebrow in today's liberated society, in their time these people were considered radicals, vanguard of a new society. They believed in a better life for the working class. They were among the first Americans to perceive the fascist threat of Hitler's Germany. But as anti-communist hysteria swept the country following World War II, people in the communist movement found themselves either denying their principles or defending them before various state and federal committees. They lost their friends, jobs, and sometimes even their freedom. Close quote. Boston Globe, Mary Thornton, April 30th, 1977. The House Un-American Activities Committee was established in 1937 and originally investigated groups on both the left and the right. Martin Dias, the first chairman of the House Un-American Activities Committee, had ties to the Ku Klux Klan, however, 
and it was not long before right-wing radical groups were ignored in favor of investigations of the American Communist Party and other left-wing organizations. After World War II, the House on american Activities Committee went after Hollywood. In 1947, 41 people were interviewed. These friendly witnesses produced a list of 10 Hollywood playwrights and producers who were subpoenaed but refused to answer questions in front of the committee, evoking their Fifth Amendment rights. The Hollywood Ten, as they were eventually known, were cited in contempt of Congress and served between six and twelve months in prison each. Another group of Hollywood producers, fearing they would be arrested and imprisoned, began naming names for the committee. Over 320 people were eventually put on a list of known communists and were blacklisted from work. Hollywood would not be the only target of the House Un-American Activities Committee. During the early 1950s, the committee's power grew and the Red Scare went into full swing. The Soviets' acquisition of the hydrogen bomb and the Korean War fueled a frenzy of fear. The enactment of the anti-communist bill, called the McCarran Act, in 1950 made life impossible for the American Communist Party. The bill essentially outlawed the party and then required members to register with the government. Not registering meant being fined. Registering meant being harassed by the government and was tantamount to an admission of treason. This era is often called the McCarthy era, but Joe came rather late to the witch hunt. In 1953, McCarthy became chair of the newly created Senate Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations of the Senate Committee on Government Operations. His tenure only lasted about 18 months as he crashed and burned with the subcommittee's investigation of the Army. By going after the military, McCarthy provoked Eisenhower into calling for a halt of the investigations. McCarthy didn't have the power to fight Eisenhower, and the committee stopped its most daring witch hunts. What isn't talked about often in popular histories is that the House on american Activities Committee continued its work on into the 1970s and that red squads in local police departments in such major cities as New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, Detroit, and Boston continued to arrest and harass members or suspected members of the party. The FBI conducted wiretaps, conducted illegal searches and surveillances, blackmailed witnesses, ruined reputations, and imprisoned members or suspected members of the party well into the 1960s. By focusing on McCarthy, much of the tone and tenor of the time was lost. That tone and tenor is beginning to be recovered by the children who grew up in the midst of the witch hunt. So-called red diaper babies, many of these children went on to be activists in their own right. They often led anti-war and civil rights protests in the 1960s and 70s. In 1998, Judy Kaplan and Lynn Shapiro edited a volume called Red Diapers, Growing Up in the Communist Left. Nearly 50 adult children of the Red Scare shared their stories and memories of the era, including much of the difficulties of being tagged as a dirty communist. In 1992, Eric Stang produced a documentary about the stories of five red diaper babies. Folk musicians, such as Pete Seeger, have kept the music from The People's Songbook, first published in 1947, alive through concerts, albums, and now CDs. The written word, the spoken word, and the song have recorded the history of the Red Scare through the eyes of the children who were affected most directly by the witch hunts. Telling stories is a powerful recording of history in virtually every human culture. The personal story not only clues the listener into the teller's inner world, but it also connects the teller to the listener, to the extent that the story resonates with the listener's experiences. The story of the Red Diaper Babies isn't just a story of political persecution. It is a story of stigmatization and oppression. It is a story of mourning the loss of security and freedom 
and the consequences of being the victim of such witch hunts. There are many reasons we tell such personal stories. Confessions are said to be good for the soul, and many tell their personal stories in order to be healed, to find peace and affirmation. Others tell their stories altruistically, to provide their audience with confirmation and affirmation that we are not alone. We share a history and an emotional bond of suffering. Stories preserve culture. Stories change culture. Stories remind us what worked in the past and what hurt in the past. Songs ritualize stories, making them easy to recite and allowing others to share in the telling by singing along. Such ceremonial recitations keep the story alive and solidify their meanings and tellings. Arthur Miller told the story of the Red Scare by evoking the story of the 17th century Salem witch hunt. Today we will listen to Nancy Hood's story of the Red Scare. She evokes not only her confessional history, but also the rituals of songs that others from the era can remember and recite with her. She also provides a history that will be tied up with her own. We are reminded of Leslie Marmon Silko's description of ceremony in the book entitled such. I will tell you something about stories, he said. They aren't just entertainment. Don't be fooled. They are all we have, you see. All we have to fight off illness and death. You don't have anything if you don't have the stories. Their evil is mighty, but it can't stand up to our stories. Let the stories be confused or forgotten. They would like that. They would be happy, because we would be defenseless then. He rubbed his belly. I keep them here, he said. Here, put your hand on it. See, it is moving. There is life here for the people. And in the belly of this story, the rituals and the ceremony are still growing. What she said, the only cure I know is a good ceremony. That's what she said. You're listening to First Person Plural on CFUV, Victoria's Public Radio, 101.9 FM, 104.3 Cable, and on the internet, cfuv.uvig.ca. Giving sociology an edge! communist? Use the dirty communist. I shot back at the little boy in my first grade class, Phillips Work School, Roxbury, Massachusetts. I knew I wasn't dirty, and I had no clue what a communist was, but I was not about to put up with insults of any kind. This incident at age five is my first clear memory of the persecution that was to shape my childhood years. It was 1951, and the U.S. was in the middle of the Cold War. Nancy's parents, who were both communists, were soon to be targets of the anti-communist hysteria gripping the country. Senator Joe McCarthy and his Senate committee had begun their witch hunt of so-called subversives throughout the United States. Wasn't that a time? Wasn't that a time? A time to try? Oh, 
time, a time to try. The soul of man, wasn't that a terrible time? For the next five years, from 1951 to 56, we were under siege. Many Communist Party leaders, including Boone, our upstairs neighbors, went underground to avoid arrest. But Dad refused to go underground and became the spokesperson for the Communist Party in Massachusetts. The FBI followed him to work and back every day. They came in twos wearing wide-brimmed hats and double-breasted coats and sat parked in their blue car outside our house day and night with a spotlight. And when our parents weren't at home, they came to the door asking us questions and trying to get in. I, a child of six, stood in the front hall. The door opened a crack. No, you may not come in. No, I don't want to talk to you. Our phone was tapped, and we received phony phone calls into the wee hours. Hey, call me, bastard! Why'd you go back to Russia? Or worse. We kept a whistle by the phone, and Dad turned our ringer down at night so we could sleep. Someone threw a rock through the front window. With my family, I marched in picket lines in defense of Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. I was seven when the Rosenbergs were executed in 1953. I found Mom, who never cried, weeping in the music room. From then on, I lived with the unspoken terror that it could happen to my mom and dad, too. The world was a dangerous place. Only years later, when I watched a documentary on the Rosenbergs, and found myself crying and shaking uncontrollably did I understand the full extent of my terror. There was no room for the fear we felt. Therefore, humor became a way of survival. This following wonderful tongue-in-cheek song is a good example. Who's gonna investigate the man who investigates the man who investigates me? Maybe he's the kind does he tries to use his head. Maybe he goes in for vodka drinking. Maybe his corpuscles are red. Believe me, brother, off with his head. Who's gonna investigate the man who investigates the man who investigates me? I don't doubt my loyalty, but how about what his may be? Who'll check the record of the man who checks the record of the man who checks the record of mine? Seems to me there's gonna be an awfully long line. One more problem puzzles me. Pardon my strange the man who investigates the man who investigates me. In the spring of 1954, Dad was arrested twice. They came to the house and arrested him while he was in bed with the flu. I remember standing in the hall and watching him put on his coat and hat and be taken away. What was going to happen to him? Would he come back? What if they arrested Mom too? Friends of ours had been sentenced to years, years in jail. Who would take care of us? They killed the Rosenbergs. I was scared. I drew pictures on the blackboard of McCarthy and Truman and Eisenhower with big noses and snot coming out. <laughs> and with gusto we children sang, 
I know McCarthy and he shall be removed. I know McCarthy and he shall be removed just like the garbage floating down the river. He shall be removed. Otis was arrested again on May 20th, along with six others under the 1919 Anti-Anarchy Act. This time he was allowed to go without bail. That same day, they arrested the books. Two wagons full from our house alone. While neighbors congregated by the backyard fence to watch, the police trooped through our house and carted away all the books from our attic and some from our library as well. We, five children, hung over the porch railing, watching the officers sweating from lugging cartons full of books down three flights. There goes Tom Payne, we cried. There goes the Bill of Rights. There goes Thomas Jefferson and Abraham Lincoln. The books were locked behind bars in the Roxbury Jail on the grounds that they were dangerous and subversive materials. Later, in 1956, when Dad was arrested along with six others, including Boone, under the Smith Act, and held in the Charles Street Jail until bail could be raised, they arrested him from his workplace. Worried and not allowed to visit, I wrote, Dear Dad, how are you? I hope the jail is not too stinky. Love, Nancy. Kiss, 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 kiss. Dad responded with a puzzle drawing and reassurance that the jail was not stinky and I was not to feel sorry for him. This next haunting love song was written during the struggle to save the Rosenbergs. What shines from your cell to my lonely cell, my loved one? What shines from your cell to my lonely cell, my loved one? Your eyes, like bright stars, shining through prison bars. Your eyes, like bright stars, Dad was among 44 communists nationally who were ordered to register under the McCarran Act. He refused, and as with all the other legal cases brought against him, the charges were eventually dismissed. By that time, I was a sophomore at Oberlin Conservatory, where the political climate was so dramatic, dramatically different that when I cautiously revealed my history, I was an instant celebrity. <laughs> But I needed to find my own path, and therefore chose not to play a leadership role in radical student politics. In a rare letter from my dad, responding to my question, was he disappointed in my choice to pursue music instead of political activism? He wrote, no. You will get involved in your own way in your own time. There will be no escaping it. You will be part of the world problem or part of its solution. I have no doubt whatsoever which side you will always be on. Never have I regretted or blamed my parents for what I lived through. 
These experiences have made me who I am, and I am proud of my parents for standing by their beliefs. As a result of living through those times, I have a strong sense of injustice, no tolerance of oppression, and a great deal of compassion for the suffering of others. I know how easy it is to lose our rights, and I hope that in the telling and singing of my story, I have raised awareness for some, given comfort to others, and encouraged each and every one of you to continue to support the civil liberties of all people. Bravo. Now I've got a helper, and I've got a bell, and I've got a song to sing all you in your flyer mm-hmm. for I've Got a Song, Yeah, you talk about how you grew up as a red diaper baby. Mm-hmm. Tell me what that means and tell me a little bit about what that meant in terms of your experience growing up. Mm-hmm. Well, a red diaper baby is a child of a, a communist, at least that's what it means to me. And both of my parents were members of the American Communist Party, so... I was born in 1946 and grew up in the thick of the McCarthy era. Now, they were uh, living in Massachusetts at the time? Yes, in Boston. Both my parents are from Massachusetts, and my dad was the chairperson of the Communist Party of Massachusetts. And when did he join the party? He joined the party uh, during the Depression. He he was totally politically unaware until the Depression. Mm-hmm. And uh, he was working as an architectural sculptor, was fortunate to have worked much longer than other people did in, in, among his friends. But when that whole profession dried up, he couldn't find any kind of work mm-hmm. and found himself among the millions of jobless Americans trying to figure out what had happened to him. And and that was not that rare to turn to the Communist Party not during at all. that time. Not at all. So, I mean, this was 1933. Mm-hmm. And uh, there were thousands who turned to the Communist Party, many who, who joined the Communist Party because of the experience with the Depression and looking for answers. That was my, what happened with my dad. Mm-hmm. He was looking to understand what was going on, and he started reading. For my mom, it was different. She had gotten involved in organizing the teachers' union out in Indiana. And she was a Radcliffe graduate, now very much an intellectual, from an upper-middle-class family, and where my dad came from, a large working-class family outside of Boston. So different uh, backgrounds, the mm-hmm. two of them. And for her, she was much more politically aware than he was. Her brother had... Uh, been a conscientious objector during World War One, and had gone as sort of a medic or assistant or something and wound up having a mental breakdown after he got back from the war. Mm. And she witnessed all of that. And also he had attended a lot of the Sacco and Vanzetti trials and would come home and discuss them at the dinner table. That was a big awakening for her as a teenager. Oh, wow. So she kind of began to become more aware of issues, then traveled and lived in France for a while when she was a young woman and became aware of fascism. Uh So, you know, all of these little things converged for her with uh, the Communist Party and the Teachers Union, and and that was how she got involved. And so they had you after World War II, and the atmosphere in the United States changed quite a bit. And they met and married late in life. 
first had my sister and then three and a half years old, later had me. Um, and the atmosphere was already starting to change. You know, being being progressive, being communist, socialist in this country in the early 30s, there was a mass movement, <laughs> you mm-hmm. know. Things really started to shift into the 40s. There was kind of a red scare that began to happen and you began to have investigations into anybody who was leftist. There was passage of the McCarran Act and the Smith Act, which outlawed the Communist Party. So it was when I was five years old that the trial was going on in the Smith Act, Mm -hmm. and they wound up sentencing, I think it was 11 Communist Party leaders. At the same time, there was a whole inquisition going on in Hollywood all over the country. Organizations were purging themselves of anybody who was even slightly (laughs) leaning to the left out of fear of being labeled themselves. When you talk about Hollywood, I guess what also coincided this time is that there was a lot more awareness of of celebrities. There was better mass communication. Mm -hmm. And so you were aware of these red scares in a way that might not have happened 20 years before because of radio, because of the way that uh, theaters reported newsreels and so forth. This is true. And the beginnings of television. I'm sure you didn't have a television when you were five, but... No, I didn't. we didn't have one until I was quite a bit older, but, um, you know, this is true. Information was certainly spread th- through the radio. Mm-hmm. And also, people were starting to be labeled and banned from radio and mm-hmm. when TV came on from TV. So singers, performers like Paul Robeson and Pete Seeger, um, who had, you know, were enjoying popularity, uh, along with this whole Red Scare, suddenly couldn't get on the air and couldn't get to perform in this country. You know, Paul Robeson had to go and live in, in England, and, and then he was living in the Soviet Union for a while. Mm-hmm. So here you are, five years old, mm-hmm. and... You're aware of the fact, I guess, or became more aware of the fact that these people being banned and these people being arrested were similar to your parents. Mm -hmm. Well, not only that, but when um, when they were when the trial, the Smith Act trial, was going on in uh, New York, my mother was called in to testify. Oh wow! So she left to testify by at what was called the Foley Square Trial. So it was already very much touching my life. <laughs> now, did you have neighbors who, you know, like kids can be cruel sometimes. Were were you experiencing, like, peers giving oh, you trouble over this? Certainly, certainly. And that was, that's my first sort of story that I tell in the I've Got a Song program, which was a boy in my first grade class calling me a dirty communist, and I didn't know what he was talking about. Well, I didn't know what a communist was. All I knew was when you call somebody a dirty something, that's something bad. (laughs) (laughs) So it was on the level of cooties for a while. Yeah, (laughs) right. I mean, I really had no no idea what he was talking about, nor did he, I'm sure. You know how children are, they absorb the tension in in the atmosphere. Yeah. So for me, some of the the memories from my early childhood are much more physical than they are sort of being able to sort of clearly put together a whole picture. It's more like I can trace back the fear that right back to age three, but I didn't have words for it then. And so you're in school, mm-hmm. and you know you you get into elementary school, and part of what the education of elementary school is about is teaching you about your government and being a good citizen and all of these kind of civic lessons. Mm -hmm. And yet you understood the government to be, well, essentially, I guess to put it in child's terms, angry at your parents and ready to get them. Did you have trouble reconciling that? I mean, on the one hand, you must have felt like every kid does, that they want their family to be good and secure and so forth and and yet here you were being probably told one thing in school and experiencing a whole other thing in your life mm-hmm. what was that like well for me when i was 
you know, a younger child talking grammar school, I, you know, very clearly felt protective of my parents, and there, there wasn't, I didn't feel tugged mm-hmm. in terms of my allegiance at all. There was a third grade teacher who we believe was working for the FBI who would actually interrogate my sister and me and the upstairs kids. Oh, my gosh. Um, because their dad had gone underground um, in the 50s when they started arresting a lot of communist leaders. Uh, there was kind of a decision from the heads of the Communist Party that people should go underground to avoid arrest. Mm-hmm. But that that would be the best thing to do. So our neighbor decided to do that, and he was underground for three years. My dad refused to go underground and, and believed that that was the wrong tactic and chose to be open about his communist his, you know, involvement in the Communist Party mm-hmm. and to take the heat. Uh-huh. So, therefore, we were targets, you see, because he was the spokesperson for the Communist Party and, in Massachusetts. And I want to be clear. When you say targets, you were you had some physical danger about this. I mean, people threw rocks on your, mm-hmm. your home, yes. that kind of thing. They, they called us all hours of the night. The phone would be ringing with people making threats or just a silence. Mm-hmm. Um, so there was a feeling of danger, and um, and the FBI was following my dad everywhere, and they also would come to the house and ask us questions, and this teacher would ask us children where our neighbor was. Wow. So there was definitely that sense, but I didn't see all teachers as being her. Uh-huh. I was able to discriminate about that, but there was a clear sense as a child that you could not trust anybody outside of our immediate circle with information. Mm -hmm. You really had to watch out, couldn't mention people's names or divulge any information because it was so dangerous to them. It's quite a lesson to learn when you're that young. That's right. That's right. But I don't, you know, I don't remember as persecuted in the school in my grammar school years as much as I was in my high school years. Mm-hmm. That was a very different experience. And high school had to have been a little bit after McCarthy, is that right? Yeah, well, it depends how you... For me, the McCarthy era continued on into the 60s, I guess because the McCarran Act continued on, and my dad was... The law was still in existence, and they were trying to get him to... to included, you had to register as a member of the Communist Party, <laughs> although the Communist Party was outlawed. So here was a catch-22. Sure, and that's... for each day that you refused to register as a member of the Communist Party, you were fined $10,000 and uh, five years in jail. They wanted him to register, and this was in the early 60s. Oh, wow. So he refused to register. Now, that's really interesting because when you hear the history of it now, when you're taught the history of it, you're taught that it was all over by 57, 58, somewhere in there. You're listening to First Person Plural on CFUV, 101.9 FM, Victoria. How did, how did music help you cope with all of this? Did you actually sing these songs? And oh, yes. Um, these songs were very much a part of my childhood experience. And whether they were songs that I sang with my family uh, or songs that I sang at a camp I went to. You know, my mother was a piano teacher, so I heard a lot of music at home. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we'd sing in the car. We, we sang a lot as a family, and... Music was definitely a source of hope and solace. I think it helped me with my feelings of powerlessness. Mm -hmm. Um, 
we listened to a lot of recordings by the Weavers and Pete Seeker and Woody Guthrie and Paul Robeson and went to their concerts. And, you know, at Pete, Pete Seeker's concerts, he would get everybody singing. Mm-hmm. So here we would be singing these songs that were, um, you know, anti-war songs. And there was this incredible feeling of not being alone. I imagine singing together put together a kind of connectedness. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Even if you were singing along with a recording or... Oh, yeah. Yeah. Very definitely. So the songs themselves are incredibly powerful for me. And and I've talked to, you know, other red diaper babies who had the same experience. So these, these songs were very much a part of our life and a part of our experience. After you put together this program, have you connected very much with other red diaper babies? Is it, are is there a group of you that? Well, there's a group of us who remains connected to each other. Mm-hmm. Um, we really became like extended family, uh, and so there's a sense that even if we don't talk to each other for a while, we can kind of pick up where we left off. Uh-huh. It really is that sense. And then in the process of Putting this together, I was in touch with a number of my childhood friends who were extremely helpful in giving me support and editing and all of that stuff. And then the the first performance in May we did at Community Church in Boston, which is a progressive church. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people came to this performance who were part of that whole childhood circle. And that's what the video is made from? Is that's that what that video is made from. So many of the people who came to that program knew these songs and knew this story, knew my parents. And <clears throat> so it was a very friendly place to do this first performance. <laughs> <laughs> and it was extremely healing, I think, for everyone who came. I know lots of folks cried and laughed and I got wonderful comments from people. Now, how have you had a good chance to? Um, have you had several other chances now to present your program? Um, I right after that was asked to perform at a peace rally on the Boston Common, mm-hmm. and I did a ten-minute segment. <laughs> <laughs> That's um, a the condensed version, <laughs> right? It's a real challenge to cut and paste. Yeah. And then I was asked, we were asked to perform a, a larger section of it for a 4th of July picnic that the um, friends had in Providence, their Quaker meeting. Mm-hmm. In doing this, in marketing this, in talking this up, I have come out <laughs> <laughs> to lots of people. And um, people that I have known, people who live in my neighborhood I've known for years mm-hmm. but never talked politics or disclosed this about my childhood and I have been most heartened by the response I've gotten from you know both people that I know but have, you know not shared on this level and people that I don't know at all who've just thought wow this is really interesting you know this is really neat you're doing this do you think that this is a timely topic to bring up now, given the uh, war on terrorism and the. Very much so, Patty. And uh, although that wasn't, I didn't know that was about to happen when I first envisioned doing this program. When I first envisioned doing it. It was very much welling up from inside me. I, this is something I've got to communicate to people about. Mm-hmm. Um, but that since Bush's taking office in September, in his response to September 11th, mm-hmm. um, I have felt even more strongly that this is a story I need to tell people about. Do you see similarities in the Patriot Act and uh, and what you went through in the 50s and 60s? Yeah. Yeah, and it's it, a lot of people do. And, you know, it's things that I have read, there's reference to the Second McCarthy era, uh, certainly in the ways that people have been labeled as anti-American. Anybody who's voiced opposition has been labeled and vilified. That kind of thing going on, and there's a sort of sense of fear. Mm-hmm. Uh, people 
being afraid to speak out. Although that is shifting, I must say, I, there is a the peace movement here is growing and gathering motion, which is very encouraging. And these are not not all people who were involved in the peace movement during the Vietnam War. These are many of them are newcomers who have never been politically active before. Mm-hmm. So that is encouraging. Have you had many young people come to uh, any of your presentations? Yes. Uh, I've had a real range in age from from 12-year-old boys to people in their 90s. um, Do you have a sense that younger people are responding to this as more than just historic? I think so. and Well, I think people can respond to my story on a lot of different levels. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think people can respond to my story on the level of what it's like to be persecuted as a child. Uh And that covers a wide range. Um, I wanted to ask you about the search warrant that's on the back of your pamphlet. Oh, yeah. I thought that that was really interesting. It's kind of hard to describe on radio, but Mm -hmm. um, (laughs) the thing that struck me about it um, was that it was a municipal search warrant Mm -hmm. from a municipal court. So this is, I mean, we kind of have this idea that it was the FBI doing this or something like that. Uh This is a good point to bring up, that, you know, it wasn't just the federal government. It was local government that was involved in this whole process of hunting down the Reds. (laughs) (laughs) And, uh, you know, the the police stations had, they had Red squads. They were called Red squads. They were particularly assigned to this whole problem of the commies. <laughs> so they they basically, their job was to find the commies mm-hmm. and harass them? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. They were assigned to... You know, I actually can't honestly answer that question. I don't know what their assignments were. I know that there were red squads. Mm-hmm. Exactly what their jobs entailed, I couldn't tell you. <clears throat> but I know that in Massachusetts, they, um, you know, Massachusetts legislature passed their own anti-communist acts. So it wasn't just federal government with the Smith Act and the McCarran Act, but you know. It was permeating through it, yes. several levels. Wow. Yes. Oh. So the books were in that arrest warrant that you're talking about with the warrant for the arrest of the books. Yeah. Which I, I found amusing in some ways too. Yeah. That uh, it says papers, pamphlets, documents, other materials. In, it that, seemed that they were afraid of the materials right. as much as anything else. It says other materials that could be used for the purpose of advocating, advising, counseling, or inciting the overthrow of the government of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts or the government of the United States of America by force and violence or other unlawful means. And this seems pretty antithetical to freedom of speech. Well, yes, and what's interesting is that they had arrested, you know, documents like the Bill of Rights and and writings by, you know, Thomas Jefferson and Abraham Lincoln. I mean, this was not all Marxist dogma (laughs) that they had arrested. (laughs) That's just amazing. Well, you know, it was, uh, it, it remains, I guess, threatening to the sitting government to think of being connected to the people and responsible to the people. Mm-hmm. Well, I want to thank you for talking with me, and um, I wish you much luck with this. Thank you, Patty, and thank you for your interest. And uh, maybe we'll uh, generate some interest in... Uh, it, is it okay to put your information up on our website, your sure. phone number and your email? Mm-hmm. Okay. That's well, we'll fine. do that, and... Um, see if some other people can hear your story. I think it's an important story you're telling. Mm -hmm. And I'm very happy that you shared it with us.
have been listening to First Person Plural on CFUV 101.9 FM in Victoria, British Columbia, simulcasted on 104.3 cable and cfuv.uvic.ca. First Person Plural is produced weekly by Dr. Patty Thomas and Carl Wilkerson. for First Person Plural is composed, performed, and produced by Carl Wilkerson. For more information about First Person Plural or Patty Thomas and Carl Wilkerson, visit our website, culturalconstructioncompany.com.